I suspect that most all of us have heard the story of Jonah. You know, the name Jonah means dove. Amittai, his father, his name means loyal or truth. I'm not sure Jonah necessarily lived up to his name, or maybe he did in his own way. If Jonah is the prophet mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14, he would have prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II, somewhere around 514, 586, somewhere in there, uh, BCE. The book of Jonah is a story about a prophet. Oh, but so much more than just a story about a prophet. It's a story about one who is complacent, one who is reluctant, and one who is disobedient. It is a, a, a short story that not only tells something that took place in the life of the prophet, but had a special meaning for the people of Israel. For the people of Israel could find themselves very much like the prophet of Jonah. Not listening and being disobedient. Not wanting to incorporate the world in their theology to bring the world to the saving knowledge of the Lord their God, but rather to push them away. For they were somewhat different. Israel was like that as well. And so the prophet Jonah, the book itself, is not only a, a message about a prophet, it's a message to a nation. In chapter 1, as Mindy read the scripture to us earlier, we see a, a prophet who hears the call of God to go to Nineveh. Now, back in Job, Jeroboam II's day, Nineveh would have been the capital of Assyria. Assyria was not a very pleasant place as far as Israel was concerned. They somewhat hated those Assyrians. For the Syrians were a cruel people, and particularly in battle. If they took hostages at all uh, in the midst of the, the battle, any survivors who might not have been slain by the sword, they would have been severely tortured and eventually killed. Cruel people. And Israel hated them. And the Word of God says, Jonah, Jonah, Go to Nineveh. Jonah listened. He heard what God said and he thought to himself, Ain't no way that I'm going to Nineveh. Not Nineveh. Not those cruel, wicked people. And in chapter 1 we see Jonah, rather than heading towards Nineveh, he goes down to Joppa and he catches a ship that's going to take him towards Tarsus, just as far in the opposite direction of Nineveh as he could possibly go. He buys his ticket, he boards the ship, he goes below deck and he begins to sleep. The ship sets sail, and lo and behold, God who is an omnipotent, omniscient God brings about a strong storm upon that sea. Now these sailors were used to storms, and normal storms didn't bother them at all. So this had to be a vicious storm that was shaking the boat. And so sailors were afraid it was going to capsize. And they began to call out to their gods, do something, do something. But their gods were false, and their false gods could do nothing. And then they went down, and they woke up Jonah. And they said, we are about to perish on this sea. We have called upon our gods, and they did not hear us. We have thrown so many things overboard to lighten the load, but we still keep rocking. We're going to perish. What did you do? Could you have angered your God? Jonah had already told him he had run away from God. What can we do to calm the sea? And Jonah says, not but one thing you got to throw me overboard. This is God dealing with me. 
And he's using the sea, and he'll use you. Throw me overboard. And the sailors didn't want to do that. They began to throw other things overboard, but to keep Jonah there. You see, they had a greater compassion for Jonah than Jonah had for the people of Nineveh. These sailors on board that ship didn't know Jonah from Adam. These sailors on board that ship were not part of, of Jonah's country. They were not fellow citizens. They were strangers to this prophet Jonah. And yet they had compassion on him. No, we cannot do that. And they did everything they could think of, but nothing worked. The winds continued to blow. The ship began to continue to rock. The waves came over the sides of the deck. And finally, when they realized there was no other choice, after praying that God would not hold this against them, they picked up old Jonah and cast him over the side of the ship. And immediately, just like that, the sea became calm. No more strong winds. And no more water coming over the sides of the deck or the ship rocking. But calm. Calm. And Jonah began to sink deeper. And deeper into the water. And God prepared a great fish to come and swallow him whole so that he might take up a short residency in the belly of that fish. I used to tell the children this would be the story of the first submarine ride. But Jonah is going to ride beneath the sea. Isn't that miraculous? That God could provide a fish big enough that he could swallow this prophet and that the digestive juices in the belly of that fish would not somehow eat away at old Jonah? That's a miracle in itself. And Jonah in chapter 2 prays it's, it's kind of a psalm of giving thanks to God. And it's a song of a repentant missionary. A repentant prophet who realizes he has done wrong. He has sinned in the face of God, in the sight of God. And now he must turn from his sinfulness and go wherever God would send him. And in chapter 3... That old fish, whatever it was. It never says whale in the Bible. We talk about Jonah and a whale. It never says whale. It says great fish. But this great fish comes up to the shore and spits old Jonah out. Don't you imagine old Jonah smell really good? After three days in the belly of that fish, a little bit slimy and having company with whatever else that fish might have swallowed in those three days. And this fish just spits him up. And here's Jonah covered in whatever, standing on the seashore and saying, you know, I got to go to Nineveh. Didn't want to go. Not my people. Can't stand the sight of those people. But I'm going to go because God said go and he has spared me. And he's given me this mission. And so Jonah marches, marches into Nineveh. He has a sermon. He hopes his sermon doesn't take. Have you ever known a preacher who hoped his sermon didn't do anything? An evangelist who hoped he could, could preach to the people and they wouldn't hear a word and they'd die and go to hell? That's what that's old Jonah. That's what he wanted of those people of Nineveh. Oh, he went into Nineveh, and on that first day, he started around the city. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be overturned. Forty more days, God's going to get you for all your sin. Forty more days, <laughs> God's going to zap you right out of this place. Forty more days, 
And I suspect if Jonah had a calendar, he was probably marking off the days when God would get rid of those evil, evil people of Nineveh. And yet, the people listened. The people heard. Other people repented. And they cried out to the Lord God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to forgive them. And God took away the punishment. And chapter 4 tells us Jonah is about as angry as an old wet hen. He is anxious. He was anxious as he could be for God to set those people off the face of the earth. And now he's going to save them and redeem them because they have repented and, and turned to him. And Jonah is mad. Mad. Mad at God. Mad at himself for even going? Chapter 4 says he goes up on the side of the hill and he pouts like a child. He finds a, a little, builds a little shelter out there and finds a vine that covers his head. I, I don't know what Jonah looked like. You know how I picture Jonah? I kind of picture old Jonah as a short, bald-headed fella sitting up on the top of a hill with a vine growing over his head, some kind of gourd up there giving some kind of shade to him, and he's sitting up there, just as mad as he can be, that God has spared Nineveh. And then God does something Jonah is going to really get ticked off at. He's going to send a worm, going to eat him to that vine, and within a day, that vine dies. And that old short Jonah sitting up there on the hillside is on that hot... Nineveh's son, bedding down on his head, sweat running down all over, no water in sight, still pouting for all he's worth, and angry that God has taken away a vine. And God said to him, Jonah, Jonah, oh, come on, Jonah, get real. Jonah, why are you so angry that I let a vine die? Did you create that vine? No, oh, didn't do it. You get angry because a vine dies. But you didn't care about 120,000 people living in the city of Nineveh. I created them, Jonah. Shouldn't I care about them? You didn't create that vine. Why should you care about it? But I created these people. Why shouldn't I care about them? And the story ends. And we don't know what Jonah did. I don't know whether he stopped his pouting and caught a ship back home or whether he stayed in Nineveh a little bit longer. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I, can, I, I like to believe that somehow... Jonah got the message. I'd like to believe Jonah understood. That's what I would like to believe. And the message of the book of Jonah to the people of Israel is that God cares about all the people of the world. He created everyone in His own image. It wasn't just the Israelites. But God created everyone in His own image and He loved them and wanted them to be part of his family. And Israel had to forget about a nationalistic type of religion and begin to reach out to all of the world. And it's going to take them a long time to get there. Even in the days of Jesus, the Jews hated the Gentiles. That would have included the Syrians and the Syrians and all the others. Hated the Gentiles, and Jesus taught them about God's love for everyone. Now let me tell you, there are some lessons that we need to learn. In the story, we discover that God is a personal God who cares about Jonah, who cares about the people of Israel, who cares about, who ca cares about uh, the people of Nineveh. He is a personal God who cares about you and He cares about me and He cares about the people down the street and the people in the next state and around the world. He cares about everyone for He has created every 
person in his own image. God is a personal God, and he has created every single one of us worldwide in his own image and likeness. That God is a righteous God, he will not condemn someone who repents of sin, but he will not condone sinfulness. What would have happened had Jonah preached 40 days and Nineveh will perish and they didn't repent? You know what would have happened? God would have wiped Nineveh off the face of the earth. That's what he said he's going to do. But they repented. We learned that God is righteous. He will not condone sin then. He will not condone sin now. He will not condone your sin or my sin. But at the same time, He is a God who is gracious and patient with us. The old bumper sticker says, Be patient with me. God's not through with me yet. God is patient. Oh, I don't know about you, but I'm glad He's patient with me. I'm glad he's gracious with me. You see, that's what it's all about. We also learn that God is omnipotent, all-powerful. He can cause the sea to rage and the storm to, to be violent, or he can calm it at the same time because he created the land and the sea. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. And we also understand he's all omniscient. That means all-knowing. He knows everything. Jonah thought he could run from God and hide from God. didn't work. Because God knows everything. You and I cannot run from God. We cannot hide from God. God knows what, where you are, who you are, and where you go. And God knows what's in your mind and He knows what's in your heart. We serve a God who is omniscient. And He knows everything. Nothing is hidden from Him. We might hide things from one another. But we cannot hide anything from God. And I said earlier, Jonah was complacent. Sometimes so is the church. And sometimes so are we. You know what that complacency is? It's kind of being happy with the status quo. I like everything just the way that it is. Don't change anything. I like it just like this. I'm happy where I am and who I am and what I'm doing. And don't ask me to change anything because change makes me uncomfortable. That's complacency. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy life as it is. Have you ever been guilty of that? Has the church, our church, ever been guilty of that complacency? Just being happy the way that we are. Don't ask us to change anything. Just leave us alone and let us go on as we've always gone, and we'll be happy with that. That was Jonah. Leave me alone, Lord. I'm happy in Israel. Don't take me over yonder. Leave me alone. I'm happy with the way things are. Sometimes we're guilty of that. And sometimes we're reluctant to any kind of change that God asks for us to have in our lives or within the life of the church. Have you ever known anybody? Or have you personally ever come to the place in your life where uh, you know there's something you need to do, but you're reluctant to do it because it's going to cost you time and energy? And there are other things you really rather do? That's reluctancy. I just, you know, I don't want to be involved in that. Don't have time for that today. What has God called you to do in your life? Who has God called you to see in your life? What has God asked you to say with your voice? What has God asked you to do in the reading of His Word and in your prayer life? What is God seeking to do in your life today? that you might be reluctant to do him because you're saying, I just don't have the time to get involved in that today. Jonah was like that. Israel was like that. Is New Bethel like that? Are you, am I, like that? Are we reluctant? 
And then there's that third thing called just plain old disobedience. Not going to do it. Not going to do it. Won't make me happy. Boy, I define happiness, so not going to do it. God, it doesn't matter what you ask of me. That's just not what I'm going to do. And be disobedient. That was Jonah. That was Israel over and over and over. And sometimes that might be you. It might be me. When we say, no, no, not going to do that. But you know, for a Christian, there's only there's one word that we should take out of our vocabulary when it comes to our relationship with God, and that is the word no. If Jesus is Lord, we don't say, no, Lord, not going to do it. We say, yes, Lord, if Jesus is Lord. Look, God sent his son, Jesus, into the world to be your savior and mine, to redeem us from our sinfulness. And then when he does that, and we say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, and we follow him, then we're willing to go wherever he asks us to go. Not reluctantly, but with a renewed excitement because we know with Jesus there is victory in all things and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we understand that individually, we understand it as a church. Not to be disobedient, but to go. What is God asking you to do? Is he asking you to love the people of Nineveh, those Ninevites? Is he asking you to love those people down the street who are not the same as you? Is he asking you to personally share your witness and your faith with somebody today? Is he asking you to get involved in the life of the church here at New Bethel that you might really have a part in, in moving the church forward where God is taking us? Is he really asking you to be involved enough that your membership is here and your love for the church is great, but your love for Jesus is even greater and you're going to seek to take New Bethel in the direction of the future and not remain in the past? Change is hard, and we're always reluctant to it. But we don't need to be disobedient to God's call. Listen, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I truly believe that God is calling us individually and collectively to be his church. That Jesus is saying to each and every one of us, I am the head of the church. I am the head of this body. I will give you direction, but you must listen. And I truly believe that as we listen, that we throw out our complacency, our reluctance, and we say, Lord, I will do whatever it takes. I will be involved in any way in the life of the church. I won't just sit in the pew. I'm going to be as active as I can to reaching others for you. I'm going to be active as I can to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to be as active as I can to have the kind of compassion that you have on a lost world. And I'm not going to be a reluctant missionary or a disobedient missionary. I am going to go out and I am going to evangelize my community through the way that I live and the words that I speak. I'm going to care enough that I will be involved so that through me, Lord, you can make it happen right here, right here at New Bethel. Jonah had to make a personal decision. Nobody else could make it for him. He had to make a personal decision. And that's the way it is in your life and in mine. When God calls us to follow the Lord Jesus, it becomes a personal call. When the Lord says, I want you to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me, he's not talking to the person beside you. He's talking to you as a personal call. 
When God says to you and the Lord says to you, you need to actively participate in the life of this church and let God, let me use you, he would say, to grow this fellowship of faith. There's only one answer. If we're obedient, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. This morning, the invitation is to each and every one of us, to each and every one of you, not to just be happy with the status quo, not to be reluctant to get involved, but to get involved fully in the life of this church and its ministry, to get involved fully in what God is calling you and me to do here, right now. But the response is as personal as the calling. Only you can respond. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in these closing moments of this service, we shall sing a hymn. It's a hymn of invitation. It's a hymn of commitment. It's a hymn of saying, yes, Lord. It is a hymn that we all know when I survey the wondrous cross. And Lord, in our own minds, in, in, in this, these closing minutes, help us to survey that cross. Help us to see where Jesus died and understand why he died and that he died for me, each one of the me's in this room. He died for all of us, but it was a personal thing. And help us to understand he's calling us personally to respond to his call. Lord, I just pray that whatever we do in these closing moments will be our way of saying, not maybe, not a little bit later on. But right now, Lord, it is yes to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.